Welcome to the Power of Owning Your Career podcast, the show for women who are seeking more fulfillment in life and simply not getting it from their current situation. We focus specifically on careers, but hey, we spend a lot of time in our careers, so making changes here will definitely create an impact in your overall happiness. I'm your host, Simone Morris, and my mission is to empower women to succeed. I believe that in order to powerfully own your career, you must decide and claim that you want to sit in the driver's seat. You must know that you deserve better and be willing to not only do the requisite work, but be willing to go out on a limb to ensure your success. Each episode focuses on profiling a leader who is clearly demonstrating ownership of their career. Join me and my guests as we explore career journeys and bring you actionable strategies to use to get into the driver's seat for your career. Because ultimately, your career is your responsibility. Let's get into the show. Hey, everybody. This is Simone Morris, host of the Power of Owning Your Career podcast. So pleased to be speaking with you today. It has been an amazing week, an amazing month, an amazing decade. So much is going on as I think about what's happening in the world with the coronavirus and how the way we work is going to significantly change. It, it just blows my mind how quickly things can change. And as I layer that on top of what we need to do to own our careers, we need to show up differently and we need to always be ready. That's why I'm so pleased to have this podcast where we're constantly staying in a mode of learning from other people about their career journeys. And this week's episode will be another inspirational one to just really keep you focused, motivated, inspired, and just to continue going with your journey. So I'm, I'm pleased to continue to be the host and um, excited about what is to come, even though we're amidst a lot going on. I'm having to rethink how I do things and how I show up. For example, I do speaking, training, and coaching, and I'm usually going around the country doing that. And now I really have to put on a lens of amping up my virtual business to allow for the changing times. So as you think about your career, think about what you need to do differently, how you're going to react to the changing times. And in fact, I have allowed myself time to think which is often not readily available, but this situation is allowing me to give myself time to just think about what's working, what's not working, and what I want to plan for, how I want to show up differently. So I want to advise you, my listeners, as you think about your careers, to, to give yourself space, give yourself grace, give yourself thinking time to think about your career and what you want for yourself. And what is the legacy that you want to leave and how do you need to get there? I will be showing up differently. I know it. I've already thought it through. And uh, one of the things that worked really well for me is masterminding, getting together with some other business women and really talking about business and how we need to show up differently. We all acknowledge fears and it's okay to be fearful of what's to come, but don't stay in that space of being stuck because you're afraid of the unknown. So it's really great to mastermind with others and to take advantage of opportunities to binge listen to a ton of episodes of The Power of Owning Your Career. If you need additional support, you can always go over to my website, simonemorrisenterprises.org, and go into the store and find some resources to support you on this journey. Trust you will be hearing a lot more from me on this topic, but for now, let's get into this week's episode. I think you'll enjoy hearing from Precious Williams. And she is a killer pitch master who's going to talk about how you can pitch your career and her career story. And uh, there is some language in there. So um, uh, just want to give you a heads up that there may be uh, PG-13 language in the podcast this week. So without further ado, here's this week's episode. Do enjoy it. As always, I have fantastic guests, and this week is no exception. Today, we have Precious 
Killer Pitch Master Williams, who is a world-class master communicator who works with successful women entrepreneurs and helps them take their professional pitching and speaking skills to the next level. She has over 24 years of experience in, in creating unique branding, speaking, and marketing techniques. Precious, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Oh my goodness. I read your book before the interview and I was just floored by your life experiences. And, <laughs> and no wonder you call yourself, I, I feel funny saying it because, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of my mom in my head saying to be professional and not use this word, but no wonder you call yourself a bad bitch because I'm like, oh my God. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Thank what you. And you know, it wasn't just used in a crass way. It was used in the ultimate way of being unapologetic about who I am and what I bring to the table. Absolutely. So as you think about your story, your experiences, your career, give us some highlights from your career. Oh, some of my highlights. See, I'm an award-winning attorney, New York City-based attorney. I appeared on season eight of Shark Tank in 2016. I spoke at InStyle Magazine uh, last week. I spoke at LinkedIn, like a LinkedIn conference the week before that. I just came back from Halifax, Nova Scotia, speaking at the International Women's Day as the keynote speaker. I am a booked and busy speaker, so I speak all over the world. Uh, my book debuted, Bad Bitches and Power Pitches, debuted at number one. Uh, I, I feel like there's so much to say. I was in a movie with Sir Richard Branson and Jack Canfield, Chicken Soup for the Soul. I've been on a lot of different business television shows from, you know, Wall Street Journal, CNN, Forbes Magazine, uh, MSNBC. And when I really think about it, all of this is such a shock to me because I am from the inner city of St. Louis, Missouri. And there's no one in my family who's done even a tenth of what I've done because I was always told, you know, we, we wouldn't amount to anything. And here I am living in New York City, way, way, way away from St. Louis, Missouri. I had a full scholarship to Spelman College, a full scholarship to Georgetown University Law Center, and a full scholarship to Rutgers School of Law in Newark. I've worked at some of the best firms in the, the world. Um, I worked for a judge in the Southern District of New York. I, I feel like there's so much to say yeah, and so no, little listen, to say. Listen, you've over answered the question. You've convinced us that you're super accomplished and determined. And so what I would say in my question is, I have a little insight since I read the book, but I'll ask the question anyway. Where does the determination come from? Because clearly you, you have this will, this strong will to succeed, and you have. So tell us where that originated from. I really believe that it came from, number one, God, of course, and number two, my grandmother. When I was a young girl, I was you know, almost murdered on November 18th, 1991 by my mother. My mother was a very abusive, mentally, physically abusive woman. And my father was a drug addict. And my mother used to always tell me every day she hated me. She wished I was never born. You know, the most horrible things that you could ever say to a child has been said to me. And if it wasn't for my grandparents stepping in when I was 15 years old, I wouldn't be talking to you today. I promise you that. My grandmother, when I went to go live with them and they're old. You know, I'm thinking, man, I'm 15. I don't want to live with old people. I'm <laughs> so glad I didn't make that decision. My grandmother used to twinkle my toes in the morning. She used to make me do affirmations in the mirror while she stood there and watched me. And she would say, Oprah's going to know your name. Oprah's going to know my name. You're the greatest of all time. I'm the greatest of all time. You are a great speaker. I'm a great speaker. I, you know, she just, she, she just filled me with love. And for the first 15 years of my life, I did not know what love was. And she took me from being a very violent and angry child. And she whipped me up into a very sensitive soul who really can tell you that the power of love can change anything. And when I get all of these great things that happen to me, I still cry about them. I wish that she were here because she used to tell me all of the things that, that, that are happening to me. She told me these would happen years ago. And she told me to keep going no matter what. You know, I... I literally can't believe half the things that I get to do. I literally can't believe, I, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that I just came back from Canada 
I can't believe that, you know, I, I got a call from People Magazine. I, I, I literally can't believe it. But if she were here, I can promise you she'd be just beaming like, oh, 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 so tell me something I don't know. <sighs> she gave me my backbone. And when things got rough, she was right there in the trenches. She used to tell me, you are the greatest creation I've ever been a part of. And it's funny, when I was in Halifax speaking at International Women's Day, I felt her on my shoulder. I felt her because, you know, sorry, I'm emotional, but I remember all the times that I went through these hard times. And the only thing that kept me going was her. And she just kept saying, you got to keep going, baby. You got to keep going for every woman that's ever felt like she would never make it. You got to keep going for all those kids who were told that they would never make it. They can look to you. And I can't believe that she's been dead 20 years. And I still hear her voice. Mm. So it was her. That's the baddest bitch I've ever met in my life. Baddest bitch I've ever met. Because she created me. She gave me my confidence. She pushed me when, when, when I wanted to give up. She pushed me. Because she saw something in me that nobody else did. And I'm so thankful. Some, some people will never feel the love that I got to feel. And I'm just grateful that I had it for three short years and it made a difference in my life. That's an amazing story. Uh, even more amazing hearing it live. And um, from what I'm reading and hearing, <laughs> you precious, it's like you've had three different lifetimes. I have. I truly have. You're right. And, and each time you've been able to bounce back and even stronger. What would you say is, is that secret sauce, that, that thing that just, you know, keeps you determined <clears throat> to succeed? Well, I, I got to give it back. I got to give it back to God. I really must give it back to him because he gave me the testicular fortitude to keep going. I remember three years ago, on January 22nd, 2017, when I attempted to take my own life, because I just thought it was over. I'd done, I, you know, I thought that pinnacle of my life was Shark Tank, and that there was nothing that was ever going to be better than that. I crashed and burned. The love of my life died. I was a severe alcoholic. I had nothing to live for. And I remember, you know, taking all of this medication that I hadn't been taking and, and, and drinking this very, very hard liquor and just wanting to be done. And waking up in the hospital and just being mad, just being mad. Like, I can't even kill myself, right? Are you serious? And then two weeks later, after proper medication, I woke up and the sun was shining. And I was so grateful to be alive because I felt it. I felt like, thank you. And I heard God, I heard him. It's not over. It's just begun. And I must admit that before, I thought I had to be perfect, show up perfect, everything has to be right, everything like that. And that's not true. People really learn from people who've made mistakes, people who are transparent and authentic, people who are not trying to hide the ball, people who will show you everything that they've gone through. And the more that I tell my story, the more that I'm honest, the more people love me because they know it's real and they know that I've gone through everything that they've gone through. And yet I kept going. I remember I was in a Bowery Mission Women's Center life transformation program. And I was in there for a year and a half. No cell phones, no television, no computers. And I used to look out the window and, and say, I, I don't think I'll ever speak again. I never get to speak on stage. Cause you know, everybody around me was just like, Oh, you'll just get a job. And, and that's it. And, and just something in me is like the God in me was like, would not, would not allow me to accept that. It just would not allow me to. Just like, you will get on stage again and it'll be bigger and better this time. And I remember some of the volunteers who came from these big companies, IBM, and I would tell them, I'm going to be a nationally syndicated talk show host. I'm going to be a speaker. And they would look at me and just kind of like, oh, okay. And when I walked out of the program on September 1st, 2018, and I walked out with clients and I walked out speaking to nonprofit, nonprofits. I was so scared I would never do it 
But when I started speaking again, I got my energy back and I got my life back. And speaking at the nonprofits led me to speaking at Viacom, which I'm speaking at Viacom March 25th, 2020, again. So, you know, I, I remember walking into Viacom, I was taking pictures and I was like, oh my God, I get to speak at Viacom, you know, loving hip hop, MTV. All, like, I couldn't believe it. I was like, I was told this would never happen. And I met one of the women who used to volunteer at the Bowery Mission. And, you know, I handed her my book and she said, Precious, I'm so ashamed. She said, I did not believe you when you said all the things you were going to do. She said, I watch you faithfully on social media. She said, everything you said you were going to do, you did. And she said, I did not believe you. And she said, I'm such a believer today that I got everybody believing in you. And that told me that people are watching whether you think they are or not. They're watching. They're watching to see if you're consistent. They're watching to see if you're constant. They're watching to see if you're achieving your dreams. Because when you step into your dreams, you allow others to step into theirs. And that's something that my coach, Ty Goodwin, always said to me when I was, when I was you know, <clears throat> trying to be her client and I had no money to pay her. She said, you'll pay me. She said, you have no idea who you are. She said, but everybody else knows who you are. And so it was God. And that voice that kept saying, keep going. No matter what, when I was laying on those park benches and riding the subways when I was homeless, keep going, keep going. Precious, now I understand why you're booked and busy. You are an amazing storyteller. <laughs> and I, am, I am caught up. You know, I have to remind myself I'm doing the interview here because, <laughs> you know, I'm just listening to the story. And, and it's an amazing <laughs> story. So, it, there's clearly an appreciation for risk in the journey that you have taken. What keeps you taking bigger and bigger risks? Because some people are afraid to take a risk. They, they're they afraid of the unknown. So what Simone, is- can I just be honest with you? I'm afraid too. <laughs> I'm afraid. I'm afraid every day. I'm afraid. I really am. But I read this book, Feel the Fear. I I, I read this book, Feel the Fear, and do it anyway. Oh, my. If you have ever listened to this podcast, I talk about Susan Jeffers, the late Susan Jeffers. Yep. Feel the Fear and do it anyway, and how that book was instrumental to my career. That is, I, I haven't had a guest who has brought it up as well. So this is amazing. Yeah, I'm so afraid. Like, in fact, yesterday I was writing to my group um, on Facebook and I was like, yeah, I'm afraid. I said, I'm so afraid. I said, I have all my dreams right in front of me. I have dreams that people have dreamed of. People kill for the speaking engagements I get. People kill to, to be in the rooms with the millionaires and billionaires I'm in the room with. And sometimes I'm afraid. Oh my God, they're going to find out. They're all going to laugh at me. <laughs> and yet I go in those spaces anyway, because I'm supposed to be there. I'm supposed to be there for every woman who never thinks she should be there. Mm-hmm. The reason why I keep going is that although my mother, you know, was a very abusive woman and a very angry woman, she used to say I couldn't. And that's why I do. Mm-hmm. To the to kids growing up when I used to wear raggedy clothes and I would smell and they would, you know, make fun of me. I do it because they said I couldn't and I would never make it. I do it for that little girl who's, who's constantly told she's not good enough. She's too fat. She's too loud. She's too black. She's too this. I do it for her because all of us are going to face that fear. All of us are going to have to face the fear. There was a movie called Mortal Kombat. I don't know if you remember. And it was Liu Kang and Liu Kang had to face three things. He had to face his, he had to face himself. I don't know what the third thing was, but I know what the first two were to face (laughs) himself. And when he had to face himself, it was so hard. Then he had to face his fear and having to face yourself and face your fear. Like I have to face the fact that I've made a lot of mistakes and there are people who still don't think I should be where I am. I have to face the fact that sometimes I can't believe I'm where I am. And then I have to remember the people in the Bible. There was no one perfect in the Bible but Jesus. And yet they all made an impact on the world. And if I made a mistake, I'm human. And fortune favors the bold. And so I'm, I go out boldly. I'm a, I do it in fear, but I go out boldly. That's why I change my hair all the time. That's why I wear blue hair, pink hair, yellow hair. And like, I don't care. Because I want to show people being different is fun. 
You can't hold me in a box. You can't put me in a box. I can't be held back. Like Miley Cyrus, I can't even be tamed. (laughs) As a black woman, I am constantly confronted with people who want me to be, who want me to stay in my place and I refuse. Why? Because I have the blood of too many of my ancestors who fought and fought and fought against odds that are incredible. And I got their blood in my veins and I'm a fighter. Call me Mike Tyson in his prime or Muhammad Ali in his prime. I'm 41 years old. I've been told you too old, you too fat, you too this, you too that. And I got to keep going. I look at Lizzo and as much as people talk about her, they're still talking about her. We don't even know the names of the people that are talking about Lizzo, but we talk about Lizzo. When I started my first company, Curvy Girls Lingerie, I was 327 pounds. And everybody said, you're too fat to be on television. You're too black. You're too loud. Nobody knows you have a law degree. None of that. When you see a black woman, you don't know what her degrees are or if she has them. It's assumed that I don't. And when I open my mouth and when I grace that stage, you will see why I'm the best in the world at what I do. Not only do I invest in myself, but people have invested in me. And so I got to feel the fear and do it anyway. I am truly afraid. I'm, I'm, I'm doing something called the Bad Bitches and Power Pitches live three-day experience. I'm freaking out about it <laughs> because I know so many people in media. I know so many investors. I know so many people. And when I had not a dime to my name, negative $400 in my bank account, I freaked that into $500,000. I freaked that into $150,000. I freaked that into television appearances, all while being 327 pounds. Precious, what advice would you give to someone wanting to successfully own their career? The advice that I would give to someone who wants to successfully own their career is truly own who you are, every part of who you are the good, the bad, and the ugly. Mm -hmm. There are going to be people who will throw things in your face and you have to keep, keep your head up. I don't know any perfect person but Jesus. And your mistakes and your flaws are beautiful. They make you beautifully human. I will tell anyone, your perceived flaws are your secret weapon. You being a woman of color or a woman or older or younger or gay or lesbian, transgender, bisexual, all of those, those are beautiful things. Do you want to know why? Because you're considered the other, they never see you coming. And when you come, come with the wickedness and the fire. Give them something to talk about. How does one come with the wickedness and the fire? Explain that to us. What does okay, that Okay, so let me tell you how to come with the wickedness <laughs> in a fire. I just told you how to own yourself, own everything about you, your flaws, your, your strengths, your weakness, own it all. Too many people are walking around as a part of the walking wounded because people have told them over and over what they lack. And I'm telling you to own what you are. There's so much more good in you than there is bad. Like when I walked into the room at 327 pounds, you would have thought I was Beyonce. You really would have thought I was Beyonce because I walked in there like, can you keep up, baby boy? I I used to walk in like I'm a survivor. And what survivors do is we thrive. So when I walked in that room, I don't care if there was a company next to me that had just made a million dollars. I don't care if there was a company next to me that had been an ink entrepreneur and fast company. I walked in that room like I was better than all of them. Why? Because I was like regular everyday people. What an extraordinary talent. I have a talent and a gift for speaking and a gift for connection. That gift is mine, whether I'm 500 pounds, whether I'm 100, a buck 20. When I say come with the wickedness, I want you to sashay in there like you own the place. You belong everywhere God puts you. When you talk to people, you look them in the eye because you deserve to be there. And when you have a chance to grace the stage, kill it every time. Kill it. Bring it and kill it. I have many questions for you. The first question I want to ask you as a follow-up is, what is the theme song playing in your head as you're sashaying out to own the room? 
Oh, oh, I have four. I have four theme songs. I, I know I wrote them in the book. <laughs> number, so number one is Bad, Michael Jackson. You know, the whole world has to answer right now to tell you once again, who's bad? Number two is Diva, Beyonce. Because I'm a diva. I'm a, I'm a diva. And it doesn't matter that I don't, I, you know, I'm not perfect, but I am a diva. And I, I know who I am. Number three is Moment for Life by Nicki Minaj. And I love when she says, in this very moment, I'm king. In this very moment, I slay Goliath with a sling. Think about that, everybody. What is your Goliath? Think about David, that little boy. And he took a slingshot. He took the best of what he had. And he killed it. While everybody around him was like, oh, you can't do it. You too young. You too little. You too this. He was like, I got the power of God on my side. Who's going to stop me? God gave me a talent and I'm going to use it until my heart stops. And number four is, is <laughs> Eminem, lose yourself. When he says, mama, I cannot, I can't rap, but mama, I cannot grow old and sail them slots. So here I go. It's my shot. Feet fail me not. This may be the only opportunity that I got. Think about that. This may be the only opportunity that I got. So I'm going to kill it in this moment. When I stood and I spoke to the producers at MSNBC back in 2011, and I talked about Curvy Girls Lingerie, I had negative $400 in my bank account. I had no idea what an elevator pitch was. But I knew that if I stood in front of these producers, whatever's going to come out of my mouth, God knows I need this shot. And I pitched and they put me on national television. And my company wasn't even real. And I made them believe in a company that did not, was not even real on paper. So I don't want to hear from people who say, you know what? It's got to be perfect. It ain't got to be nothing but what you say it is. Because if you don't believe it, nobody else will. So... Precious, uh, one thing, uh, t- I, have, I have like 10 questions. <laughs> go for it. <laughs> no, but um, let's go back. Who's the rap artist that you mentioned? Eminem. Oh, okay. okay. And Nicki Minaj. Okay, okay. All right. Ma- wanted to make sure that the listeners heard that because I started laughing and I, I want to make sure people hear who you were talking about. So you gave us um, – a resource already. You talked about feel the fear and do it anyway as a resource that's helped you in your career and in your journey. Can you talk to us about other resources online or otherwise that have helped you to soar in your career? Okay. So, um, what, what has helped me? I love going to conferences and, uh, summit. So I, I love this book and I have it right next to me. How to Win Friends and Influence People. Mm. Love this book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Because you know what? I teach soft skills. I don't teach math, science, English. I teach the soft skills. How to walk into a room and dazzle people. How to speak to anyone. How to make small talk, large talk, whatever you want to call it. Um, I asso- I'm with International Association of Women. I'm with E-Women Network. I'm with Master Network. These are, these are the kind of organizations that I'm a part of that have helped me and open doors when no doors would open to me because of the mistakes that I had made. Um, I love LinkedIn as a resource because when you can't get to the gatekeepers on the phone, you can get to them via LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. I love the fact that Facebook, I get to be as real as I want to be. Mm-hmm. I'm even as real as I want to be on LinkedIn. As a, although some people are like, could you, could you, you know, maybe if you were a little bit more professional, I'm like, uh, Okay, so you're watching me, but I don't know who you are. That's great. Okay, great. I just want to make sure we're clear. We're clear because I don't know who you are, but you watch me every day. Oh, well, I wouldn't use that word. Well, I'm, you're not me and I'm not you. Well, I wouldn't name my book that and it's not your book. And I love Think and Grow Rich. And then I also love by Dennis Kimbrough, Think and Grow Rich, A Black Choice. That book totally blew my mind. Because we can think and grow rich. Rich in love, rich in relationships, and rich in wealthy in money. All of that is your birthright. But you have to be who you are and not the carbon copy of someone else. I will never be Sir Richard Branson, nor will I be Oprah, nor will I be Wendy Williams, nor will I be Tyra Banks. But I am the original Precious Williams. 
is it. And I am the hashtag killer pitch master. And I was sent by God to help you slay all competition with a killer pitch. Well, I believe you. And I, I think all the listeners believe you, Precious. I'm, I'm wondering, it feels like you have a calling in the ministry as well. because People say that all the time. And sometimes <laughs> I feel like that, like, oh, my goodness, you know? <gasps> Uh, I, it's an amazing um, testimony, and I'm, I'm feeling. I, I honestly kind of feel you coming from a pulpit. I, I don't know why that's popping in my head, but you're not the first to say that. I promise you, you're not the first, and I probably won't be the last. Then, nope. Uh, wonderful, wonderful. There's so many great things. Can you think of a moment in your career where you avoided responsibility, or someone else was calling the shots for you, and what did you do to overcome that? when somebody else was calling the shots for me. Hmm. Well, I avoided responsibility. Girl, that, that was a lot of my life. <laughs> um, yeah, so when I got kicked out of Georgetown University Law Center on March 15th, 2002, I wanted to blame everybody else, but it was really my fault. The truth of the matter is getting in the Georgetown wasn't hard. And it wasn't because I'm black that I said that. No, I got in because I earned the right to be there. The truth is I hadn't dealt with a lot of my personal issues and I was 22 years old. And I walked into Georgetown and I felt less than because everybody's father or mother was a diplomat, a senator or something like that. And I felt like when people asked me questions about my family, I felt so less than because nobody in my family had ever, had ever done, had achieved anything of note for the world, right? And... I felt like I was stupid. I felt like I couldn't read right. I felt, you know, I came from Spelman. So it's not, you know, I, I just allowed my fear and overwhelm to get in my way. And so on my, on my 23rd birthday, I uh, went away for three, two, two and a half months. And I came back on March 15th and they disenrolled me. And the dean took personal glee and saying, you black people come up in here and you can't handle the you know, whatever. And I, I remember breaking down because I believe what he said about me, I wasn't good enough. And for five years, I was depressed. Even though I got into, got a full scholarship to, to Rutgers, even though I was at Rutgers School of Law, Newark, I beat myself up. I didn't even talk to my line sisters. I didn't talk to my Spelman sisters because I was ashamed and embarrassed. And it wasn't until I graduated from Rutgers on May 25th, 2007, that I let it go. Everything that everybody said about me, I let it go. And I said, I cannot keep letting people dictate my life. And no school is going to determine how hard I fly. I will outshine everyone at Georgetown if I have to, and I will outshine anyone in this world if I have to. Because I am talented, and no school owns me. And when I look back at that experience, I can't believe I let five years go by. First of all, I can't believe I left law school. <laughs> all, I can't believe I did that. But I accept all responsibility in that I was young. I, I give it that I was, it was a youthful indiscretion. But I accept responsibility that no one should have been able to take away what my grandmother had instilled in me. I didn't need my family to be the Kardashians for me to feel like somebody. I am somebody because my grandmother told me I'm somebody and because the Bible told me I'm somebody. And once I accept the responsibility for, you know what? It is what it is. I have never looked back and I have never, when I go to DC, I roll up on Georgetown. Like, yeah, it is what it is. I roll up like, yo, I used to go here. Mm -hmm. They like, you graduate? No, I did not. But you know what? I am precious Williams. And you know who I am. Yeah. So, yeah, you can kick out of law school and still make it, everyone. Yes, you can. And my Spelman sisters, when I did, when, when, like, my Spelman sister, she used to work at Disney. She was an engineer at Disney. She said to me, we were sitting there having dinner one day. She says, the fact that you got into Georgetown, she said, I could care less you got kicked out. She said, the fact you got in is what I'm still stuck on. <laughs> I said, we've gotten girls from Harvard. Yeah, she said, yeah. And she said, and why are you, why would you ever think we would look, look down on you? Why would you ever think that? She said, look at you today. You give us hope. She said, Georgetown, that, that's, that's, that's 20 years ago. 
Look at you now. So that's, that's the time I let everyone else dictate who I saw myself to be. And I don't anymore. Well, what a wonderful story you have, Precious. I honestly, I read the book and enjoyed it. And I know you said it's going to be a series. And so. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> and yeah. I was kind of thinking, well, what kind of bitch am I, you know, <laughs> <laughs> going through the process. And, and uh, so you, it, it's been an amazing uh, interview. I want to thank you so much for being a guest on the Power of Owning Your Career podcast. Please tell our listeners how they can stay connected with you. So you can stay connected with me. My email address is precious at perfect pitches by precious.com. On LinkedIn, I am Precious Williams, Killer Pitchmaster. You can just put Precious Williams, you'll see Killer Pitchmaster. On Twitter, I am at perfect pitch P. On Facebook, I am perfect pitch p and on instagram i am perfect pitches p that is how you can get in contact with me awesome well thank you so much for all the wisdom and all the feel good story inspiration that you have shared with us on this episode of the power of owning your career podcast thank you so much for having me this has been such a delight Thank you for listening to the Power of Owning Your Career podcast. It is my hope that you enjoyed today's episode. You can check out the show notes for this episode on the SimoneMorrisEnterprises.org website by clicking the podcast menu. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes and tell a friend or two about it. 